great. All right. Um, let's uh, uh, finish up with our last speaker for tonight. Um, announcements before I forget them. Um, uh, daylight savings time is like tonight. So don't forget to adjust your clocks. Forward, spring forward, fall. Yes, forward um, an hour. So you get an hour less of sleep. So sorry about that. And uh, we're going to be starting at 10 a.m. tomorrow, I believe. Yeah, 10 a.m. tomorrow. Um, after uh, our next speaker, we're going to be meeting at Lakefront and Langdon, as we did yesterday. So you should join us um, because I'm going to have some more beers. That would be great. Anyways, without further ado, our next speaker, um, she's the host of the radio show and podcast, Skeptically Speaking. Please welcome Desiree Shell. All right. Can everyone hear me? Good. Uh, so before I get going, uh, I bet that some of you are fond of the, the phrase that I used to title this presentation, no gods, no masters. Now, I know that atheists consider this theirs, uh, but does anyone know where this comes from? One person. All right. Uh, its English origin comes from a pamphlet handed out by the Industrial Workers of the World during the 1912 Lawrence Textile Workers' Strike. The more you know. Um, also, Trevor Zimmerman, uh, shout out to him. He is my brilliant co-worker, and he is every bit as obsessed with this kind of stuff as I am. Um, so we researched and wrote this presentation together, and it was ridiculously fun. So. Uh, so I'm Desiree Shell. You might know me as the host of Science Radio Show, uh, Skeptically Speaking, but maybe you didn't know that my day job is as an organizer for a public sector union in Canada, uh, Socialized Medicine Canada, 30% unionized Canada, relatively economically stable Canada, smug Canada. <laughs> So for years, I've been thinking about the labor movement and the links it has to free thought. Uh, but until uh, the lovely Quinn Heck uh, asked me to come speak here, uh, I didn't really have the chance to explore them. Um, because this is Madison. Madison, where so many breakthroughs in American labor standards started, and now where Scott Walker has decided that it's time to kill the unions. Thank you. So in Alberta, uh, I followed what was happening in Madison very closely, one might say obsessively, and I couldn't help but think that if there had been more public outcry at the first sign that Walker was uh, planning to engage in large-scale union busting, that things never would have gone down the way that they did. Um, but maybe not, uh, because people don't really understand unions anymore. And specifically in regards to the free thought community, maybe you guys don't know where your interests overlap with the interests of the labor movement. So I decided to find out if any noted free thinkers had anything to say about unions. And it turns out they did. Robert Greene Ingersoll was a Civil War veteran, American political leader, and orator during the golden age of free thought. Many of his speeches advocated free thinking and humanism and often poked fun at religious belief. He was remarkably prolific and popular for the time and in addition to the lecture that many of us best know him for, The Great Infidels, he titled the piece, Warm Words on the Cheerful and Comforting Doctrine of Eternal Damnation. <laughs> he was also a staunch advocate for the eight hour workday and for the rights of working people. From his essay, Eight hours must come. The working people should be protected by law. If they are not, the capitalists will require just as many hours as human nature can bear. We have seen here in America streetcar drivers working 16 and 17 hours a day. It was necessary to have a strike in order to get to 14, another strike to get to 12, and nobody could blame them for keeping on striking till they get to eight hours. And I think we all know who Einstein was scientifically. Politically, Einstein was a bit of a lefty as well, and he even authored an essay titled Why Socialism. He was a founding member of the Princeton Federation of Teachers, Local 552, signing its charter in 1938. And here's what he had to say about smart people joining unions. 
I consider it important, indeed urgently necessary, for intellectual workers to get together, both to protect their own economic status and to secure their influence in the political field. <laughs> And I hope I don't have to talk too much about Bertrand Russell either, he of the cosmic teapot. Is there anyone here who has not read Why I Am Not a Christian? Oh, you should do that. So Russell wrote and spoke a lot about religion and philosophy, but he was also highly politically engaged, including, stand, uh, including standing as a candidate for the British Labour Party back when it was still a leftist party. As a philosopher, Russell was one to choose his words carefully, so I was very pleased to see his strong endorsement of the labor movement. If we look to the basic writings of Bertrand Russell, you will read, the labor movement is morally irresistible and is not now seriously opposed except by prejudice and simple self-assertion. Succinct. And then, there was Stephen Jay Gould, brilliant popularizer of science who had a particular bee in his bonnet about creationism. Gould was highly political, whether tackling racism in the printed word or showing solidarity with people on picket lines. He was also part of a group known as Science for the People in the 1970s that distributed newsletters among scientists, engineers, and others with articles like Class Struggle in the French Science Establishment black revolutionary scientific worker jailed without bail, and using pregnancy tests for hiring discrimination against women. In addition to Mark Twain being a fantastic writer and noted free thinker, he was also a member of the Printers Union in New York and the Western Boatmen's Benevolent Association in Mississippi. His pro-worker views could be summed up by this quote, who are the oppressors? the few, the king, the capitalist, and a handful of other overseers and superintendents, who are the oppressed, the many, the workers, they that make the bread that the soft-headed and idle eat. Now I assume that you're already somewhat acquainted with those famous free thinkers, so here are some people you might not know. Prince Peter Kropotkin was a Russian geographer, geologist, zoologist, and evolutionary theorist who is considered to be the first person to clearly demonstrate that cooperation was important among animals and that an understanding of animal cooperation could tell us a lot about human cooperation. This led to his theory of mutual aid, that cooperation was an integral part of natural selection. Anarchists, who have long been ardent supporters of the labor, of the labor movement, derive much of their political stance from Kropotkin and his theory. Now he said, rebels are everywhere to be found who no longer wish to obey the law without knowing whence it comes, what are its uses, and whether arises the obligation to submit to it, and the reverence with which it is encompassed. The rebels of our day are criticizing the very foundations of society which have hitherto been held sacred, and first and foremost amongst them that fetish law. The critics analyze the sources of law and find they're either a god, product of the terrors of the savage and stupid, paltry and malicious as the priests who vouch for its supernatural origin, or else bloodshed, conquest by fire and sword. And next up is my own personal hero, Emma Goldman. Anarchist, feminist, and early 1900s pro-gay activist, Goldman was no stranger to picket lines and fighting for workers' rights. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, who directed her deportation hearing, called her one of the most dangerous women in America for not only her radical politics, but also for her outspoken atheism. She was the author of essays like Minorities versus Majorities, The Tragedy of Women's Emancipation, and The Philosophy of Atheism. The philosophy of atheism represents a concept of life without any metaphysical beyond or divine regulator. It is the concept of an actual real world with its liberating, expanding, and beautifying possibilities. As against an unreal world which, with its spirits, oracles, and mean contentment has kept humanity in helpless degradation. For Goldman, atheism was a necessary condition for the anarchist vision of a free society. Now I hope you have heard of A. Philip Randolph. 
He became a union organizer for black workers in 1917, and by the 1940s, he was a leading civil rights activist. He can be seen beside Martin Luther King Jr. during his powerful I Have a Dream speech. He wrote for the black worker magazine The Messenger, which included essay contests like Is Christianity a Menace to the Negro? He was a signatory to the Second Humanist Manifesto, and the American Humanists awarded him Humanist of the Year in 1970. In our reason for being, he said, the combination of black and white workers will be a powerful lesson to the capitalists of the solidarity of labor. It will show that labor, black and white, is conscious of its interests in power. This will prove that unions are not based upon race lines, but upon class lines. This will serve to convert a class of workers which has been used by the capitalist class to defeat organized labor into an ardent, class-conscious, intelligent, militant group. And here is Joe Hill. He was an immigrant worker frequently facing unemployment and underemployment who became a popular songwriter and cartoonist for the radical union, the Industrial Workers of the World. He was explicit in his understanding of the bosses and the churches working hand in hand against working people. Not only were good Christians to obey the authority of their bosses, but they were to receive their just rewards in the next life for doing so. One of his most famous songs, now considered to be a union classic, was The Preacher and the Slave. A long-haired preacher's come out every night Try to tell you what's wrong and what's right uh, But when asked about something to eat uh, They will answer in voices so sweet Hey, you will eat by and by When you die, that's a lie. Now, Joe Hill was executed by the state of Utah November 19, 1915, for writing songs like this. Huh? But he left them to us. These are our people's songs. So you damn well ought to learn how to sing it, don't you think? Huh? It's done Baptist style. I must be some Baptists around here somewhere. You understand what I mean? Are there any Baptists here? Good. <laughs> So we know that there were some notable and intelligent people who valued both workers' rights and free thought, which is a fantastic argument from authority. Uh, but beyond that, is there any link? I think so. We can look at some of the least religious countries in the world and find some commonalities. In Phil Zuckerman's 2008 book, Society Without God, Zuckerman takes a look at the highly irreligious Scandinavian countries and how a lack of religion does not impede their ability to live a decent life. And if, like me, you're tired of hearing about the awful atheists in the USSR and China, uh, we should make a clear distinction between legally mandated state atheism and what I like to call organic atheism, uh, the kind of atheism that occurs naturally when people have a decent education and good economic security like the Scandinavian countries. So Zuckerman notes that the precariousness that is all too common for many Americans is actually very rare in the countries that he studied. So where the church may help a struggling family in America, the Scandinavians will have a well-funded social program to help you back on your feet. And where the church may explain where we came from and how to behave in America, in Scandinavia, a well-funded education system can explain at least some of the mysteries of life and can even give us some hints on what morality can look like without the need for global floods and crucifixions. And the American dream, or what many of us call plain old class mobility, the American dream actually happens more in Scandinavia. Before you tell someone to pull themselves up by their bootstraps, you should first make sure that they can afford boots. And I would be doing my sisters here a disservice if I didn't also mention that with greater access to economic equality in Scandinavia, women are more educated and more socially mobile, allowing them to escape the trap of the church and home life that at least some women in America find themselves stuck in. 
So these things are all nice sounding economic choices and policy directions. But how did they get to that point? Well, it wasn't because a bunch of secularists sued the church and the state in hopes of crippling the right-wing influence of the church on politics. It was because the countries in Scandinavia, in part inspired by the revolutionary movements not too far east, had a history of labor union militancy and labor politics. Unions not only helped to elect labor-friendly governments who created the highly generous Scandinavian welfare states, but they struck fear into the hearts of even their liberal and conservative parties so much so that they've left those lovely policies alone. So it's likely that this isn't the perfect recipe for cooking up an atheist country, but these countries are the best examples we have of moving from Christian populations to irreligious ones. So let's compare a few countries. Here are some rates of irreligion and each country's trade union density. These are as of uh, 2005, uh, because that's the last year for which I could look at both complete sets of numbers. So union density is represented by the dark blue bar and the percentage of non-believers is in light blue. Now do keep in mind that these figures do not necessarily represent the number of people who identify themselves as atheists. Uh, the numbers refer to people who do not believe in God. So that's uh, atheists, agnostics, and various types of non-believers which is the reason for those wide ranges you see between the percentages. So looking at that, it seems like higher union density and higher rates of people losing their religion match up fairly well. But of course, correlation is not causation. I know the drill. Uh, none of this is anywhere near rock solid evidence. But I do think that there's enough going on in the divergent and parallel economies and histories of Scandinavia versus North America that we can safely say there might be some kind of connection. And I would wager that we would see better attitudes towards secular and atheist populations in America and even in Canada if we look to improve the things that our Scandinavian cousins are already doing well. And I also think that getting kids out of poverty and into a university will do more to keep them away from church than keeping a cross out of a 9-11 memorial. And you can come fight with me about that later. <laughs> Meanwhile, I was shocked to find out that there is also some overlap between the worst kind of religious people and people who oppose unions. This is Pat Robertson, Southern Baptist minister who founded Regent University and ran the 700 Club, the flagship television program of the Christian Broadcasting Network. When he ran for president, he did so on a platform that included such gems as banning pornography and getting rid of the Department of Education. He said, it's time to say we must take back the schools. We've got to do something in America and take away the school system from the left-wing labor unions and their left-wing cohorts that are destroying the moral fiber of the youth of America. And Jerry Falwell, evangelical pastor who founded Uni uh, Liberty University and said that, among others, lesbians were to blame for 9-11, said labor unions should study and read the Bible instead of asking for more money. When people get right with God, they're better workers. <laughs> and Citizen Link, the political arm of Focus on the Family, used this as the headline of an article on their website. But let's make it a little bit more representative of the mindset. But that article is correct in one way, and probably only one way. Uh, over the past several election cycles, unions and their members contributed millions to fight against religious-based exclusionary policies and legislation, especially around issues of life, religious freedom, and marriage. For example, California's teachers' unions joined forces with gay activists in 2008 to try to defeat Proposition 8, a ballot initiative intended to preserve marriage as being between one man and one woman. Now, despite having contributed more than $1.25 million, Prop 8 was soundly approved by the voters. 
And now we come to the whole reason uh, that I was able to put my meandering, half-formed ideas down on paper. Uh, Madison and its Scott Walker problem. At his inaugural prayer breakfast, Walker said, the great creator, no matter who you worship, is the one from which our freedoms are derived and not the government. And thankfully, this led Annie Laurie Gaylor, co-president of the Freedom from, Religious, Freedom from Religion Foundation, to respond, it is frightening that the highest executive in our state suffers from the delusion that God dictates his every move. Consider the personal and historic devastation inflicted by fanatics who think they are acting in the name of their deity. Diana Butler Bass on BeliefNet wrote, Scott Walker is neither Roman Catholic nor a mainline churchgoer. The son of a Baptist pastor born in Colorado Springs, the heartland of the religious right, Walker is a member of Meadowbrook Church in Wauwatosa, a non-denominational evangelical church. Meadowbrook's statement of faith, a fairly typical boilerplate of conservative evangelical theology, includes beliefs in biblical inerrancy, sin, exclusive salvation through Christ, and eternal damnation. So we are reasonably sure that Scott Walker will not bring about the secular topia in Wisconsin. <laughs> but who else is he pissing off? Unions! What was fascinating to watch about the uprising in Wisconsin was that while unions were one of the main targets of Walker's budget repair bill, it wasn't just unions fighting back. If you spent a night in the Capitol building, like some of my colleagues did, you would have talked to small business owners, retail workers, students, and anti-war activists. Farmers brought their tractors in from around Wisconsin to show their opposition, and those radicals in the police force and fire department spent a lot of time in the Capitol, too. And there were even some moderate, social justice-minded faith groups. So why were there so many people out there who had effectively nothing to do with unions and wouldn't be directly affected by an attack on collective bargaining rights? First of all, it may be hard to believe, but there are those people out there who are just genuinely compassionate. And I know, I forget about them too. Uh, there are also always some self-interested people who do make the connection between unions and a higher quality of life for non-union folks. But I also think it was because Walker didn't campaign on killing collective bargaining rights. Your country really prides itself on the value of democracy. It is, it is a very big thing to you guys. And Scott Walker did not have a mandate to crush democracy. Neither to crush it in the form of pretending that it was what the voters wanted, nor in the form of stripping collective bargaining rights. People were not expecting that, and many people wanted him out. Not enough people, unfortunately, but still. So what was his justification for such divisiveness? How did Scott Walker try to make sense of all the blowback that he was getting? What did he take solace in in those turbulent times? The journal Sentinel did an interview with him, and Don Walker wrote, asked about his faith and the effect of months of turmoil in Madison on his family, Walker said they relied on prayer. We realize that all this is just a temporary thing and God's got a plan for us. Who knows where it might be beyond just serving as governor of this state. But if we stay true to that, there's always comfort. And God's grace is always abundant, no matter what you do. Unless you join a union. <laughs> or you vote Democrat. <laughs> or you have the audacity to be poor or gay, or you'd need an abortion, but other than that, totally abundant. So there seems to be a whole lot of that in your country, um, or maybe that's just the way that your media presents it, but regardless, Canadian politics is somewhat less hyperbolic for now. And I attribute that, at least in part, to unions. The stronger Canadian labor movement can be seen to improve the lives of Canadians through two forces. The first, they created a third political party that has acted within the electoral realm to improve the lives, working conditions, and human rights of all Canadians. And second, acting independently of electoral politics, they advocate for improvements regardless of the party in power. 
the labor movement is a place where the infrastructure of dissent can flourish, where those opposed to the status quo of corporate and or church power can come together to organize, to resist, and to improve. Now again, I'm not saying that unions are the only reason that US and Canadian politics are so markedly different, but look at where our countries diverge. Public education supported by unions. Secularists talk at length about the dangers of allowing church and school to intermingle. But it's not just that science courses may have to teach the controversy or that sex ed classes may consist solely of abstinence education. The erosion of public education affects the democratization of opportunity. So maybe your rich or even middle class friends would fare okay under a voucher system, but what about those who can't afford a decent school? and they get stuck in a diminished public system, or worse, a charitable religious school. Social safety nets supported by unions. Let's say you're one of the ones who graduated from university right when the recession hit, and you're all out of student loan deferments. Or your parents lost their jobs and you've decided to delay school so that you can work to help them pay the mortgage. Or maybe you've been diagnosed with cancer and you have no health insurance. Now there are two ways these kinds of situations can be dealt with. The whims of private and often religious charity or by a stable and planned social safety net which attempts to distribute fairer outcomes for all. And as I mentioned before, countries with strong social safety nets tend to have higher class mobility as well with more instances of people moving from the low end of the income spectrum to the middle and higher. Universal health care, I'm so sorry you guys. <laughs> supported by unions. The union roots of the Canadian Medicare system can be traced to the Democratic Socialist Party, the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation or CCF. The CCF was a pro-labor party first elected to power in the province of Saskatchewan in 1940. They balanced the books and introduced hospital insurance first and then universal medical coverage later. The effectiveness and popularity of this program uh, turned out to be adopted in 1966 on a federal basis. And since then, trade unions have been among the strongest defenders of Canada's universal health care system. Laws against discrimination based on race, gender, sexuality, or disability were supported by unions. In 1947, one year before the UN adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that same pro-labor government in Saskatchewan adopted the Saskatchewan Bill of Rights, prohibiting discrimination based on race or religion. And that paved the way for the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Hey, access to abortion supported by unions. Carolyn Egan in The Socialist Worker wrote that when the Ontario Coalition for Abortion Clinics was formed in 1982 and they began to work with Dr. Henry Morgenthaler to challenge the federal abortion law, one of the first outreach approaches was to the Ontario Federation of Labour. Resolutions were passed at local union meetings and submitted to their convention. A major organizing campaign occurred and it was widely supported and it passed with a strong majority. Now this was a huge boost for the movement and it showed the broad popular support that existed. Same-sex marriage, supported by unions. Remember Emma Goldman? She was supporting pro-gay attitudes in the early 1900s. It took the mainstream labor movement a lot longer to catch up, but you can look through history to find many allies and overlap between LGBTQ issues and labor. And in Canada, it wasn't until two labor-supported parties, the NDP and the Bloc Québécois, held the, ba the balance of power in a minority government that a vote for same-sex marriage could pass. And although there are some secular arguments to be made, uh, to restrict both same-sex marriage and abortion, they are not particularly compelling. The vast majority of arguments against abortion and against same-sex marriage are based on religious values. Now, if you look at those, you might notice that atheists and humanists have publicly supported many of those things. Hmm. But unions have done more than lobby around issues that happen to be the ones that churches de, uh, generally oppose. They've also taken on the church directly. 
Who here likes asbestos? <laughs> no? Okay. In the 1940s, foreign-owned mining companies operated asbestos mines in Quebec. So those greedy, out-of-touch, job-killing unions started asking for things like safety standards. Over 5,000 workers staged a massive, riotous, four-month-long illegal strike facing fierce opposition from the Catholic-backed government, as well as many elements of the Catholic Church. That strike was able to galvanize opposition to the Union National government and is widely credited as sowing the seeds for what became known as the Quiet Revolution, where Quebecers voted out the Union National and paved the way for a modern, secular society. And the incoming liberal government took the reins of education and health away from the Catholic Church and put it into the hands of a democratically elected government. Canada's great, eh? <laughs> okay, next up, uh, right to work laws. There seems to be popular, uh, popular support in some areas, at least, uh, of this idea that if you work at a unionized workplace, uh, you shouldn't have to pay union dues if you don't want to. Does anyone know where that comes from? The first advocate of right to work laws was the Texas based Christian American Association in the 1940s. Their fear of the rise of black equality and the costs to industry of an increasing unionization rate led the group to push for right to work laws to curtail not only the workers' bargaining power but the political threat to right-wing Christianity that the labor movement represented. Worried about the prospect of unions providing good jobs and dignity for black workers, the innovator of right-to-work laws, Texas lobbyist Vance Muse, said, from now on, white women and white men will be forced into organizations with black African apes whom they will have to call brother or lose their jobs. So is there a correlation between religiosity and right to work? Right to work states are in blue. And most religious states are in darker green. Let's just look at that again. Uh, the right to work states are in blue and the most religious states are in darker green. Of the 24 most religious states in America, 19 of them are right-to-work states. Interesting. So let's talk about the capital occupation and secularism. While nobody in the capital occupation in Madison was chanting, this is what freedom from religion looks like, uh, there are links to be made, so just bear with me. Scott Walker's budget repair bill was taking away the ability of people in Wisconsin to organize themselves, to talk about their issues at work, and to try to make things better. Now this is in line with conservative religious views that stress obedience to authority rather than dissent or even disagreement. And that's a part of it, but we all know that the budget repair bill just wasn't about attacking unions. Public education was also under fire with massive funding cuts. And again, if we don't have a good public education system, two things will happen. Christian-run schools will fill the void and people without money won't have access to a good education. And if you don't have an education, you might believe some of the things that Falwell and Robertson spoke. But if we, were to if we were to reverse course, fight back against Walker or whomever succeeds him on this bill, and help strengthen Wisconsin's labor movement, I have a feeling that we would see teachers fighting not only to keep their pension plans, but for reduced class sizes, for anti-homophobic education, for pro-science curriculum, and more than that, because they wouldn't be worried about losing their jobs and their mortgages. So I have to ask at this point, how many people engaged in the protests at the Capitol building or otherwise? Okay. Because if you were there, you would have noticed large groups of students, teachers, and professors, people who value public education. Nurses who, by and large, support universal health care. Government workers who witness firsthand the dangers of a weak welfare state. These people see the benefits of ensuring that their country is governed by rules that are not based on someone's religion. They are the people that want many of the same things that you guys do. And there are also people who are already really angry 
and really angry people are ripe for coalition work. So let's look at it this way. What do we stand to lose by ignoring the labor movement? Public education, which would increase our, religions on, our reliance on religious schools. Government-run crisis services, which would increase our reliance on public or private and church-operated charities. A work-life balance. The busier people are making ends meet, the less likely it is that they're going to have time to sit down and think. And we all know where thinking leads. The infrastructure of dissent. That's the funding and organization we need to ensure that critical resistance to corporate and government excesses has a place in our society. And union-run education programs, which teach people about their rights at work and how to participate in a democracy. And what can we gain by supporting the labor movement? Coalitions with pro-science unionized teachers, LGBTQ activists, climate activists, allies in opposition to religious-based arguments against feminism, allies in the fight for long-term goals such as poverty reduction and social safety nets, and helping everyone to realize that we can accomplish far more working together than praying together. So what am I asking you to do? Because you know I'm going to ask you to do something. Join a picket line. Wherever workers go on strike, we all have the opportunity to build relationships with people who are trying to improve their situation. And who knows? If they have the ability to go against the authority of their bosses, maybe they don't think much of the authority of their church either. Join a union. This is actually a lot harder than it sounds. The real fear and intimidation that people face when joining a union should never be understated. People can be fired and ostracized for coming out as union friendly on the job. But if you are interested in better wages and working conditions or in affecting social change, call a union. Or join an industrial union. Uh, if mainstream unions are too right wing for you, and they are for some people, or too bureaucratic, you could join the industrial workers of the world. Uh, the IWW is committed to solidarity unionism, uh, which is more concerned with workers taking action on the job than it is with contracts and union certification. And there are also a whole lot of atheists there. Trust me. You could also join a political party. Hold them accountable and keep discussions about union support and secular issues alive in your party of choice. And don't be afraid to leave if they don't deliver the goods. Most countries in the world have more than two parties, you guys. Most. Don't discount the idea that you could have more than two parties. Take part in coalition building and coalition work. Work in common cause with teachers unions, teachers aides unions, government unions, and other progressive organizations in, de <laughs> in defending what is left of your public education and social safety net systems. And these don't have to be anti-theocratic in nature uh, or an immediate goal, but they can accomplish those goals in the long run by weakening the need for big church in society. And build your community. There's been a lot of discussion around some atheist quarters about the problem with atheism is the fact that it doesn't do community very well, but it's something that churches do really well. When labor temples were first built, they offered members a place to get together that wasn't a church, which was often the only other gathering place around. Labor temples were a place to discuss people's work and their lives, and they played a huge role in the community. And there are still labor halls that double as community centers. Use them. And just one last thing before I wrap up. I know that some of you in the audience are going to accuse me of cherry picking. Could be right, could be right. Um, I'm definitely open to other evidence, but I am becoming far more confident in the idea that the Enlightenment, like wealth and power, aren't about to trickle down anytime soon. So we can just point and laugh at, laugh at the fundamentalists and do some science and hope that people stop going to church, but I'm really hoping that you will join me in a different approach. 
Instead of secularism and atheism as a road to individual fulfillment, let's choose solidarity and support for each other as the path to a world where human empathy and collective knowledge replace the need for authoritarian religion and superstition. So as they say, out of the blogs and onto the streets. And I will see you on the picket line. Thank you. Good. If anyone has questions, you can buy me a beer. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. Um, you can buy her a beer at Lakefront and Langdon, which is where we're going right now. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming today. We'll see you tomorrow morning.